I think at the heart of it all, and I'm sure you'll agree, is that the people living with dementia and their family, carers or significant others are and should always be at the heart of any of this work. Any strategies, any work, anything that's done, not about us, without us. That's one of the little phrases. And I think it's so important. And yes, we're getting a lot better at that in society, the lived experience, but we've still got a long way to go. And they are the people. They are the, you know, they are the people. They're, they're living that experience. They are the people with the voices. And that's what we should be championing all the way. Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. We're so glad you found us. We're the global community of authors writing about Alzheimer's and dementia from personal experience to light the way for others. I'm Mary Ann Shuko, a registered nurse, author, and dementia daughter. And I'm Christy Bernieds, a licensed educational psychologist, dementia daughter, Al's author, and coach focused on the sandwich generation. Please join us for bi-weekly episodes with our authors as we talk about their dementia journeys, sharing intimate details and painfully obtained knowledge to help others currently on that path. We hope these stories offer you comfort and support as we strive to break the silence and stigma surrounding a dementia diagnosis. May one of our authors speak to your experience. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Hi, it's Mary Ann with exciting news. All's Authors has published a brand new anthology, Poetry for the Dementia Journey, now available in ebook and paperback through Amazon. Within its pages, you'll discover a variety of voices writing about the diversity of dementia care experiences, caring for a mother or father or spouse, witnessing the decline of a sibling, reflections on the time before the diagnosis, the years of care, and the aftermath. Poetry provides us with a meaningful way to explore our experience and emotions regarding dementia and to express ourselves when we encounter the many different joys and dilemmas caregiving can bring. You'll find details on how to order the book in the show notes. Please remember to leave a review on the book sales page once you've read it. Reviews do help boost a book's visibility and helps readers find it. Thank you for your support of our efforts to erase the silence and stigma that often accompany a dementia diagnosis. Hi, Marianne. How you doing? I'm good, Christy. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. And I am excited to talk to Gina Awad. She is amazing and she's got incredible energy and has written a book for caregivers that I think is just phenomenal. It's called United, and it's about bringing different people together to talk about caregiving and especially around dementia. So she's got some great insight into how this all works. And and it's nice to hear from someone who is a professional talking about caregivers. So it's a good it's a good conversation what'd you think well she has a unique perspective not the usual caregiver written book written from her own experience witnessing dementia as a child and that isn't what inspired her to do her war and to study later on in life she chose to you know pick up dementia as her passion project so she's a lot like us 
And her philosophy is a lot like all authors, where she sees the value in people collaborating and sharing their ideas and their stories together instead of competing with one another to sort of help everybody because we're all in the same boat. And yeah. she's one of our British authors, so that's exciting too. And uh, we had a really great discussion. Yeah, it's terrific. And like I said, I just I, I love her energy and uh, the different things she's doing to promote caregiver well-being, especially and just dementia awareness. So it's really good stuff. So I'm excited to share it with everybody. So, all right, let's get into it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our podcast. And we are excited to have Gina Awad on our show today. And she's the author of United, Caring for Our Loved Ones with Dementia. So welcome, Gina. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me on, ladies. It's great to be here. Yeah, we're delighted to have you. And so we'd like you to kind of just start and tell us a little bit about yourself, your experience with caregiving, with dementia, and how your book came about. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, yeah. So when I was a child, I was eight years old, I used to go into care homes with my grandmother. My sister used to come as well. She, I was eight, she was seven. And what I remember, and it stuck with me at the time, was my aunt and grandmother used to do creative arts with the residents. So what I would call is not the residents that were engaging with the creative arts, but those that weren't. And those that weren't appeared to me from an eight-year-old, which is about 46 years ago now, seemed isolated, distant, disconnected, frightened. And I felt they just seemed, yeah, they just seemed disconnected with the world. And I felt really sad about that. I felt like an empathy towards that. And I believe that stuck with me at the time. I didn't realize until later on that they were actually living with advanced dementia. And then when I was 41, so in 2011, I enrolled in a course with the Open University in health and social care. And I decided then after that first year to do a degree in health and social care with the Open University. And my second selected module was dementia care. And when I started sort of reading up about that and watching the videos, I was just so inspired. I'm interested in the human mind and people and relationships. And what I found myself doing was going off on a bit of a tangent and looking at all sorts of stuff and reading all sorts on the internet about dementia. And having reflected and, and, and speaking to lots of people, because I started doing some voluntary work around that, they were kind of, what drives you to do what you do? And I remembered, you know, I, I just thought it was passion, identifying with being misunderstood, and those, you know, just generally the, the human mind, until I started reflecting back more deeply and realised those early times when I attended the, the, those care homes with my grandmother and people living with advanced dementia. So that was the catalyst for that that's beautiful so it really was a childhood emotion that really stuck with you and then that experience that's beautiful that's wonderful. and i think yeah it is and i think i've learned a lot about myself over the years and like, i'm a really highly sensitive person i'm also quite introverted as well which people don't believe but they, they call you can be called the extroverted introvert and that's me and I just, the reason I say that, ladies, is because I feel very in tune with people's emotions. So I do pick up on people's emotions, which is great in some way, especially when it comes to dementia, but also it can be challenging in life as well. But I just believe and feel that I felt such a strong connection with those people living with advanced dementia. And that's been my journey over the last 12 years. Yeah. That's wonderful. Tell us a little bit about your illustrator, Tony. Yes, I can. Pony was, and I say was in the past tense because very sadly, he actually died in October of last year. But mm -hmm. Tony was a prolific cartoonist and actually had been drawing for Private Eye, which is a satirical sort of political magazine that's been around in the UK for the last 37 years. So he was drawing initially for them. and. You know, and, and he, he drew for them right up until he died. But he, his father lived with dementia and he has a book out or he had a book out in 2014 called Take Care, Son, My Dad Lived with Dementia. And 
I met him through him sharing a sort of he came to Exeter basically for a social sciences event and read from his book in a local theater and I was so inspired by him we basically connected via email and then began literally a few months later working together he's an incredible illustrator I've never met anyone like him I mean I've met lot, lots of illustrators but the thing is with Tony what was great about his work is that he can capture the emotion in his illustrations but also it's the ideas he has so even though you know people will see the drawing it how he comes out with that so he'll look at some narrative and he'll create something but also without the narrative he can create something very special very quickly and prolifically so working with him taught me so much about being creative and he's sorely missed basically oh, sorely cool. missed yeah how did you decide that you wanted to have an illustrated book well we were already working together tony and i in dementia so so i met him in 2016 we started working together in 2017 um and we did all sorts of things so i had a scenario in a local bank where there was an issue with a family living with dementia that i was asked to help with just spontaneously i happened to be in the bank or going past the bank at the time so i was invited in by the bank manager to help because she knew that i was involved with dementia and then when i had that experience i thought this experience is really important I want to document that experience and I feel that I am somebody that wants to do that. So when experiences happen, I want to document them and I would maybe write about it, write a blog. And then I thought, oh, I'll speak to Tony and see if he will do an illustration to accompany that, which will bring it alive. So that's what he did. And from there on, we did a couple of cal calendars in 2019 and 2021. And then, of course, the pandemic hit and mm, you know, we knew that a lot of services would be cut off because of the pandemic. And I actually wrote something here. And so it's probably easier for me to, to read it because it's kind of, I'm just trying to find it. It, it kind of links into why we decided to do Create United. And I said here, I worked with Tony a lot. And but lockdown causes to focus our minds on how we could collaborate to make a difference. And of course, we know and we knew at the time that people with dementia would not be able to attend some of the services that, that they were attending. And also that would make it a lot more difficult for care partners and caregivers. And it would be really difficult. So so we thought, how could we enable some of those to get their those people to get their stories across? So, and as we said here, knowing many services were limited or withdrawn, it inspired me to reach out, as in myself, to family carers and enable them to tell their stories. Yeah. So, and so I chatted about it with Tony and I said, what do you think? And he said, yeah, that, that sounds a really great idea. So we approached the publisher that published his original book. So without Tony, it, it certainly wouldn't have happened. I've got so much to thank Tony for. And then they sort of, publishers said, you know, they were interested to know more. So we then had to go out, collect some stories and start putting like a portfolio together or an idea of, of the project and how it might look and work. And then they accepted it. So from there, we were away. But it, it took a couple of years. It was a real, it was a joyful challenge because there were lots of bits behind the scenes when you come to doing a book, especially through a publisher, that can be really challenging. And I've learned so much. I really have. Was this the, your first book? Yes, yes, it was, or it is. But I, I am working on very early stage second book. And that's because Tony and I actually discussed it before he died about a year before, following on from one of the stories in the book, which is Sienna's story, which is a composite story I created based on experiences and stories that weren't in the book. And I sort of thought, what's missing here? And I wanted to cover certain things like young onset dementia and future planning, future care planning. So I'm, so Tony and I discussed that and we were going to look at it and we started putting some ideas together, but sadly he's no longer with us. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I need to find another illustrator, which I'm working on. If I can, it won't happen, but if I can, it will happen. And I believe, I'm very fatalistic, I believe it will happen. Um, can you tell us the story or what happened? The bank. Okay. Yeah. So 
I was, it was a Monday morning. I was passing by the outside of the bank and the bank manager came running out to me and she said, um, I've got a bit of a problem here. And I said, right, okay. And she drew me in and basically there was a lovely lady there who was crying and she was the daughter of the father who was living with dementia. And the father was living, who was living with dementia was in the bank trying to withdraw some money, which he couldn't do because he he had he did have some capacity but he also didn't as well so that was a challenge so his daughter had power of attorney now what i didn't know is when i arrived is that apparently he tried to get the money out of the bank and the bank knew him so they sort of rang the daughter explaining that he was trying to do this so it ended up that the daughter came in to try and console him and of course he then got very angry and said that she was trying to steal from him and she obviously isn't and wasn't and it was a real challenge. So the actual bank manager sat with, do you know what I'm recording? Because it was literally seven years ago. If I sat with the lovely lady who was the daughter or the lovely man, but it, one of us with each one, and we basically reassured them, consoled them, and we managed to sort of organize it that he could have his card and sort of withdraw a small amount of money because the daughter was there and the pin number was there. So we managed to work it through, but it was very much a team effort. And it took somebody outside of the family unit to basically help reassure the gentleman that, you know, there weren't things, sinister things going on. Right. I think these sort of things happened a lot. And um, see this going back, like I said, this is going back sort of six, six, seven years ago. And it was really interesting because before the bank manager got involved, one of the first team staff team were actually linking up with the chap and they didn't know how to deal with it so they mm -hmm. obviously called her over and then then the bank manager explained that it, it, she found it really challenging she dealt with it and it was fine she dealt with it really well but what she learned from that and, and that was what was interesting about it, it was a whole learning process is that her staff and the staff team maybe needed some more understanding of dementia so from that I actually went into the bank and delivered some information sessions around dementia so I could help inform them of what some of the presentations are for people with dementia that are living in the commu community and to help people and the staff team understand a, li a little bit more about it to enable them to basically support people in the community with dementia. That's so wonderful because I'm sure, I, I mean, I know that sort of thing does happen quite often and things around money and it's very hard for someone with dementia who's managed their life and then now they can't and they don't understand why things are confusing and it's like this person's trying to take it from me and yeah, yeah that is definitely a, an occurrence that happens and so wonderful that you then went in to educate branch managers or bank managers the staff about this issue so that they could be more sensitive to that and, and be able to investigate it a little bit differently. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, I think, ladies, from that, you know, I, I kind of see every opportunity, every situation or every experience or every story that happens, I just feel that there is, there's more to add to it. And I think, what can we do? How can we spin this around positively? What happens? What can we look at that? So, Firstly, obviously, I, I spoke to Tony about potential illustration, but then, of course, another strand of that is to then go back to the people involved because I wanted them to be comfortable with me sharing that story, but also anonymize their names if that's what they want, which right. is what we did. So we anonymized their name and I, Tony created a, a lovely illustration and I sort of asked the bank manager if we could use that. And then it got in the local paper and a lot of people sort of commented on it saying how oh, great. So then obviously, because the bank manager acknowledged at the time that there was some learning for them and that they invited me in to try and help them educate in my um, role in the Active Dementia Action Alliance. So we could all learn from that. And I think that was mm. great. Mm. How, have, how have the families that you wrote about, the stories that you tell, how have they received your book and have you heard any feedback? And yeah, I mean, it was amazing working with the families and it wasn't just, oh, we found six families because there's seven stories, but six six of them are, are obviously true family carer stories, one of the composite, as I mentioned before. So we had to reach out and find 
find those families. And um, that was quite a challenge because, I mean, I've, I've got a lot of resources. I know a lot of people in the country, of, in the dementia world, but it, it's trying to find a family that, first of all, happy to share their story. And, you know, there's logistics around it as well, you know. So, but they really enjoyed sharing their story. And of course, that worked with Tony up in the north of England in Manchester on Zoom, me in the south of England on Zoom, and speaking to the family, some of which we'd never met, the may mm -hmm. never met, and talk to them on Zoom, and me ask curious questions, and then respond, and then uh, go back to the drawing board, if you like, Tony to create some illustrations alongside my narrative, which of course is a challenge, because when you're hearing a lot of information from a family, we knew that the stories were only going to be around 12 to 15 pages. And a lot of that would be illustration. So the narrative would be fairly minimal. So it had to be really edited well. And that was the challenge, I think. And then when we'd come up with the narrative and Tony's illustrations were in pencil rough, we'd then go back to the family and share it with them to see how they responded. And they all responded really well. And there were only a few amends that needed to be done. That I think, I don't know, maybe Tony and I had a skill to get to the heart of the story and make sure everything was shared. And that's what we did. And, and it was so exciting. We've had, I mean, we've had some great reviews. We've got lots of great reviews on Amazon as well. So yeah, it's really good to know. And that's from other people, other families. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Great. Can you tell us about your work with the Dementia African Alliance? Yeah. So I, when, as going back, ladies, when we talked about my passion for dementia in 2011 when I was doing my degree, health and social care degree, I then went off on a bit of a tangent looking to see what was available in the community around dementia. And I, I became a dementia champion, which is an Alzheimer's Society initiative back then. That was a, a good few years ago now. It's now changed. But I was, I trained as a volunteer and I was delivering dementia information sessions in the community. And I had to find people to come to them and space, free space. It was a voluntary role, which is a bit of a challenge because back then, sort of 12 years ago, people weren't, sort of, yeah, they obviously were doing work on dementia, but it wasn't a priority, whereas things have changed quite a lot globally. And eventually I, I found a local coffee shop and I found some human beings come along and I delivered um, an information session with the resources that I'd been given. And I then did a few more and in different areas, different places, supermarkets, banks, care homes. And after about 20 sessions, reaching, I don't know, 150 people, there was a recurring theme that was coming from these, the responses of sessions, which were sense of hopelessness, helplessness, despair, fear, and quizzical responses as why are you giving us all information? Why are we not receiving this from our local GP practice? And I said, well, obviously GPs are general practitioners. They only specialize if they specialize. You know, everyone's got their own sort of passion or whatever, and they know what they know, however. But so I said, you know, I had this information and I was just sharing it. I was basically a medium to share that information. And then that got me sort of really thinking, what is happening in extra around dementia. So I went off, like I said, on a tangent and I started meeting the local counsellors, the local charities, the memory clinics and different people over a period of several months. I was living and breathing it basically. And I realised that there was a lot going on around dementia in the community, but it wasn't joined up. I don't know how it is over in the States. It's obviously very different protocols and processes, but, and I thought, goodness me, a diagnosis of dementia itself is difficult enough. You know, people don't want to find out by default how to navigate this complex system. And that's what was happening. So I then discovered um, an initiative called the Dementia Action Alliances, which is a national initiative whereby communities across the country were trying to come together to make a difference for dementia. Some of those were funded by the local councils. And again, this was going back about 11 years ago. Some were led by volunteers. Some were big projects. Some were very well funded. Some weren't. And there was only in the southwest of England, there was only three or four local alliances, which is very minimal. There's now hundred. And I was asked by the national alliances, uh, there's, I said, I'm assuming there's something in Exeter, but it hasn't sort of 
come about and it's not in the public domain. And they said, no, there isn't, but you could set something up. And I had no idea what that looked like or what would that look like. But fast forward quite a few years, I did, I have. And going back to those information sessions, I've now delivered about 300 sessions reaching around 3,000 people in the community. Wow, that's wonderful. And I, you know what, I, I think it's similar here in that that whole piece of, and perhaps this is where you got your title united, it's, you know, there's like these different disparate parts and people doing different things. And so it's having that collaboration that can really be powerful. I feel like in, in the U.S. too, there's lots of different little places and not everybody's in conversation with everybody else. So it's, yeah, there isn't like a unified voice or anything. Lori LeBay from Alzheimer's Speaks has started a dementia map, which is a way to try to connect all of these different local resources, which is a huge undertaking on her part. But the idea is for people to be able, you know, you plug in your zip code or where you live in your neighborhood and try to discover like what is available in the area because they're not very well advertised. It's kind of like an underground and people don't really know what's going on. And some people are very surprised to find out what exists. In the yeah, I totally agree. And I think that, you know, and it's still my calling now to try and find out how we can collaborate and as well as collaborate as, you know, teams and people, you know, that are passionate about dementia, people living with dementia and family and all the services that go on. I think at the heart of it all, and I'm sure you'll agree, is that the people living with dementia and their family carers or significant others are and should always be at the heart of any of this work, any strategies, any work, anything that's done, not about us, without us. That's one of the little phrases. And I think it's so important. And yes, we're getting a lot better at that in society, the lived experience, but we've still got a long way to go. And they are the people, they are the, you know, they are the people, they're, they're living that experience. They are the people with the voices and that's what we should be championing all the way. So like a lot of competition, you know, Christy and I were discussing that before you came on to the show about different personalities, maybe comp competing with one another, you know, trying to push their own product or their own methods. And even like with the authors, you know, one of the first obstacles that we encountered with all authors is this sense of competition. Like, why should I support somebody else's book? I have my own book that I want people to buy and to read. And, you know, our feeling was that people need more than one book. If they're going to read, they're going to need more than one. So it helps to be out there and, and sharing each other's work and help people find what they need and not worry about competition. And maybe some days people, you know, organizations, they can combine resources and become bigger and stronger. Yeah. I, I think that, I mean, that's just such an interesting, you know, what you shared there is it's really inter interesting, Marianne, because over the years, and I'm guessing I'm putting my vulnerability out there to some extent, I feel it, it, it's there, I need to share it, is competition is huge. And one of the, one of the things around that, I, and I, I have struggled with, is that people, they, I don't know what it is, but they are pushing their own work and their own resources. And it's like, why do we want to collaborate with this person? Why do we want to do that? Why we need to be better or whatever? We're all looking and we're all focusing on the same thing. We want to help people living with dementia and their families to live a better and more inclusive life and to be, you know, autonomous and empowered. Why do we have to have a, put our ego in the way? We need to move it right out of the way and focus on the work and what our passion is. And I love the fact that Al's authors, you know, you, you bring all of that to the table. And, and there's something at the end of our chat that, that I'll talk about, which is a, a national UK initiative around reading and shared resources. And I think, you know, it's all about supporting each other, isn't it? Mm -hmm. How do we get, how do we get, a, how do we get past this sort of competitiveness and we are better and, you know, what, how do we get past that lady? I'd love to, I'd love to know. I think when people, that's a great question. <laughs> oh my gosh, million dollar question, right? I do feel like when people have a good collaborative experience, 
they see the power in that. So it is about you reaching out, me reaching out, Mary. all of us that are into that see the power in collaboration. That one really good experience can help. On the same side, it can also, you might not have a great experience with collaboration. So I guess, you know, for me, I take it as I just have to be concerned about me. Who am I as a collaborator? And am I a giver or am I looking at things from a marketing perspective kind of thing? And surely there are times when we all have to do that. You know, everybody has to make a living. So there's that. But it's, I find, like, like for me, what this speaks to is like what you did with the banking association, right? That, you know, here's something that you have an expertise in and you saw a need and then, you know, people don't know what they don't know. And so that's very inspiring to me. I'm doing a little bit more speaking these days and I'm actually going to be speaking to a banking association. So that's fantastic because that gives an opening and yeah, that's wonderful. I did want to ask you, if you wanted to share a little bit, do, the part that you read to us was about your illustrator, but do you have a part of the book that you would like to read to us? Well, I was going to, yes, I would love to. Thank you okay. so much. Obviously, the interesting part of this is, as we know, a lot of it is illustrations, which of course people won't see, but I hope that it, it sounds okay. And this will be quite interesting for me to read this with knowing that people won't see the illustrations, but to be very mindful that I'm not expecting people to imagine what the illustrations would be like, but if they do access the book at some point and they want to, they will be able to see that and it will tally up. But we, you could show us one because we will probably put this on our YouTube channel so you could hold it up to the camera if it'll see it, you know, and you could show oh, us yeah. one of them. But you don't have to show... Yeah, but that... Absolutely, I totally get it. An illustrated book is hard to describe. So this is Kate and Fred's story. Kate's life changed when her husband, Fred, was diagnosed with dementia. She had to adapt and learn new skills. Before his diagnosis, Fred was a social, gregarious type. We loved our holidays together. We went all over the place. He supported me on my many marathons with a cheer and a wave. But with his diagnosis of vascular dementia, things began to change for us. Fred, the boiler is packed up. I don't know anything about that sort of thing. It was different for us then. The responsibilities were mine. I had to learn quickly. Fred used to love cooking. He was a great cook. Sadly, I'm not, but I'm learning. Some things can be difficult. Time for a shower, Fred. I'm not going in there. Evening, Fred. Your pint, sir? But by giving him a routine like creating his evening pint at the pub, he feels comfortable and content. We have amazing carers who come on a rotor system. They're fabulous. Fred's got to know them now and recognises their faces. Here we are, Fred. Slack time. Fred and I think the world of them. It was so important to me that I could find my own space and be independent, if only for a short time. Why have you only eaten half your dinner? Because it's on the wrong side of the plate, said Fred. I noticed Fred would leave portions of his meals. I realised he left the food on the side of the plate, furthest from him. I served the next meal as a mix of quarter-sized portions. He ate three of the four. There's always something new to learn. I sometimes feel angry and guilty. Dare I think of respite? Am I being selfish? Doubt the constant. But through it all, we are together. Not the us that was, but a different us. I discovered a wonderful initiative. So now once a week, Fred is collected by a host and taken to their home with up to three people with dementia and similar interests. It's a break and a different experience. Fred really enjoys it. And there's a home cooked meal too. Lunchtime folks. But those dark feelings of failure, ineptitude and inadequacy often reoccur. I asked Fred once, can you imagine anything worse than me as your carer? Yes, he said, you not being my carer. 
Thank you. That's so lovely. That's so lovely. And there's so much in that. I mean, the whole piece about, you know, you learn one thing one day and then you get that routine and then you have to change that because people are changing all the time and we're changing. And then those feelings of, for the care partner, of, you know, am I good enough? Am I doing this right? Am I selfish to want some time to myself? It's just all of it. So, so rich. Thank you so much. It is, isn't it? And, you know, a lot of people, you know, as I said, there's seven stories there. And, you know, you could read them all in one go in an hour. It's fine. Or you could just read one and reflect on it. And I think that's, that there's a lot of depth to the stories, even though there's little narrative. And I think that's what makes them really special. And what's great about, about Unite is it has been endorsed by people living with dementia and families as well. Can I just read what a couple of people have said about it? Is that okay? Sure, yeah. So one, one reviewer told us each person's journey is individualized, yet we see from these collective observations a deeper wisdom learned from the shared mutual experience of others. And somebody else said, United is an accessible short read that will give support and advice from the point of view of those who have been through it themselves. So I know you've learned a lot about dementia and doing the work that you do and then also writing this book. Are there some things that you would want our listeners to know that are, I love the phrase you used uh, um, of. Not about us without us. Say that again. I love that. Not about us without us. Yes, that's wonderful. And so. Maybe are there a couple nuggets you would want people to take away? Yeah, I mean, I think that whoever's listening, depending on who, who that is, I think, first of all, as a care partner, you are not alone. You know, you are not alone. And there are some rich support groups that people can access. I mean, all over the world, it, you know, every different area, there's going to be different things there. So sometimes seek out that. And a lot of people feel, oh, I don't want to go to a support group. I don't want to hear all this negative stuff and all of that. But sometimes, you know, especially, for example, for people living with dementia, they have some great peer support groups and their lives have changed. Their lives have literally changed. And they've actually, whilst getting the diagnosis has been such a huge issue for the people, you know, living, receiving that diagnosis, They've then spent, some, certainly some people I know have spent some time going into a, a fairly deep depression because of the emotion around that diagnosis, some, sometimes relief of the diagnosis, but then the emotion of having to process what's that going to look like. But of course, we know that when a person is diagnosed, they don't wake up the next morning a different person. And as Wendy Mitchell says, and she's obviously one of your L's also, you know, a, a, a dementia diagnosis is the beginning. There's a middle and an, uh, there's a beginning, a middle, and there's a whole lot of living to do throughout that time as well. So that's really a message to the, for anyone that's diagnosed, but also to acknowledge, you know, you are special. We're all unique. We all have different skills and qualities, whether we are living with dementia or any health condition or ailment. We're all unique and we've all got a lot to bring to the table and we need to acknowledge that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. But I did want to give you an opportunity to share with us an initiative that you are a part of, the Reading Initiative. So would you like to share a little bit about that with us? I would. It's really exciting. So it was Dementia Action Week here in the UK in the middle of May. And um, behind the scenes, a charity that was set up in 2013 called the Reading Agency, have a strand of their work called Reading Well. And they have a number of booklets where well, they have the one Reading Well for Teens, we, Reading Health for mental, mental Health and Reading Well for Dementia. They had, they issued a book list in 2013 and there were about 35 books and resources on that list. They wanted to refresh that a couple of years ago. So over the last two years, They've been working with Innovations in Dementia, who are a great community interest company, who are very much about championing and advocating for people living with dementia. And they have been involved in the co-production of the new list 
So the new list, they wanted a shorter list this time because the idea is once the list was finalized, they would be available in every library in England and Wales. So that list was issued, if you like, published during Dementia Action Week with 20 books. And United is one of those books. Oh, that's so wonderful. But what's also great is so is Peter Barry and Deb Blunt and also Wendy Mitchell. Wonderful. Very excited to have Al's authors well represented. That's fantastic. You are. You are. So there's 20 books. And I mean, there may be more, but I, I know there's definitely three that are Al's authors. So and what's great as well is that all of those 20 books are going to be translated into Welsh. Oh, that's oh, great. That's actually, is, I wonder if is Jane Mullen's book in there. Um, I think that she think was like, in the last list. I think she was in the last list. So it, one of the things it says, obviously, they, they will be free for loan to borrow in public libraries in England and Wales. That means that every library in England and Wales will have one of, the, one of each of our books there, which oh, is wow. an incredible thing. And for me, it's about, it's what I love about the heart of it all is how they've come up with the final list is that people living with dementia and their families were part of that review and selection process. And again, it goes back to what I said at the beginning, co-production, they've got to be at the heart because they are the expert. Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations. And that's wonderful. And I'm so happy you shared that with us. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. So where can people find you? Can you tell us a little bit about where you are and people want to seek you out? Where should they go? I don't have, I'm not on Instagram. I think I'm a bit behind the times, but I'm not. I keep thinking I'll do it. And I think that's another platform. I can't keep up with it. So I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter, which is obviously now X. And my Twitter handle is award underscore Gina. So that's on X. And I'm on, as I said, I'm on LinkedIn. I don't have my own website because my work's going to be under the, the umbrella, if you like, as the Extra Dementia Action Alliance. So you can type in extradementia.org.uk. But if you do Google my name in dementia, there will be lots and lots of work that comes up sure. on the pages there. So there's ways of getting hold of me and also seeing what I've done. And I've also got a little radio show in Extra in Devon, which I have on just when there's a fifth Saturday in the month. So four or five a year where I invite lots of lovely guests on to speak about their, you know, their experiences as well as charities, care home managers and innovative work. So that's wonderful. And we will put those links in our show notes so people can find you. And that's terrific. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much, ladies. It's yeah. been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Caregiving is a challenge, whether your person has dementia or not. Finding helpful tips and learning new strategies from people in the know is critical. That's why we at Owls Authors love the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast from Elizabeth Miller, who also happens to be an Owls author. Elizabeth speaks from experience and has important and often fun conversations with other caregiving experts and professionals. And we appreciate learning tips on self-care, discovering new resources, and feeling empowered to support ourselves as caregivers. You can find the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast wherever you download your favorite podcasts or visit the website happyhealthycaregiver.com. Thank you for listening to Untangling Alzheimer's and Dementia, an Alz Authors podcast. For more details on this episode, please see the show notes. If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review and subscribe to it on whichever platform you use to listen to your favorite podcasts. For more information on Alz Authors, please visit allsauthors.com. While you're there, be sure to browse our online bookstore where you will find hundreds of carefully vetted books on Alzheimer's and dementia. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. 
please email your thoughts on the podcast to allsauthors at gmail.com. We are a 501c3 charitable organization, totally reliant on donations to do what we do. If our author's stories move you, please consider contributing to our cause. Remember, you are not alone. One can sing a lonely song, but we chose to form a choir and create harmony.